comes from Sky Jatani. He's a Christian author and speaker, and he wrote about his kindergarten-age daughter's homework assignment. Help your child identify as many logos as possible. Jatani said that without hesitating, she identified Pizza Hut, Target, and Lego. I like this girl. <laughs> At home, she collected the logos of Disney, Jell-O, and Goldfish Crackers. Later, while drinking a glass of water, she proudly shouted, That says Ikea! She spotted the tiny logo and printed on the bottom of the glass. Jatani reflects, reflected, Should it scare me that my five-year-old had memorized more corporate brands than Bible verses or even names of relatives? Also scary was the fact that no one taught her to identify logos. We didn't have corporate logo flashcard drills at home. Zoe internalized these logos simply by living for five years in a brand-saturated culture. This sort of brand marketing has been so effective that the average 10-year-old has already memorized between three and 400 brands. <laughs> when these children become adolescents, each with an average of $100 of disposable cash to spend each week, they will select from these brands to construct their identities, identities that they can eat, drink, smoke, drive, play, ride, and wear. And so the spiritual value of shopping is not lost on marketers. Douglas Atkins, author of The Culting of Brands, When Customers Become True Believers, states plainly that brands are the new religion. So how many of us could, wow, say that our children might know more brand uh, recognition than they know God's word? You know, as I think about this, I was thinking about... Um, different uh, jingles and slogans that I remember as a kid. So here we go. Are you ready? Oh, I'd love to be an Oscar Mayer wiener. That is what I truly like to be. Because if I were an Oscar Mayer wiener, everyone would be in love with me. So that's part of it. There's another verse to that as well, which is negative, which is why I didn't put it in here. <laughs> <clears throat> How about this phrase? See if you remember this one. To all beef patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions, and a sesame seed bun. Where is that from? McDonald's, 1975. Whew. And here's one more. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. I got a million toys at Toys R Us that I can play with. I don't want to grow up. I'm a Toys R Us kid. They got the best for so much less. You, you really flip your lid. More bikes, two trains, two video games. That was my favorite. It's the biggest toy store there is. Gee whiz. I don't want to grow up, but maybe if I did, I couldn't be a Toys R Us kid. More games, more toys. Oh, boy. I want to be a Toys R Us kid. 1980. There you go. There's my childhood for you. Um, so I remember those, right? It's just they go around in my head all the time sometimes. And there's other ones. There's other jingles. There's other... Um, you know, advertising things that you just remember. But I also have a lot of God's Word memorized. And it's come from Scripture memory as a child, um, through uh, release time over in Shippensburg, to working with Child Evangelism Fellowship for so many years, and learning uh, the, the verses with the gospel so that I could share it anytime, anywhere, with anybody. So, you know, when I think about John 3.16... Can you say it with me? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life, right? Some other ones I have memorized is uh, Romans 3.23. For the, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't reach the perfection of God because of that sin in our lives. Romans 5.8 tells us this, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? Romans 6.23 for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just. He won't forgive us our sins. And cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Oh. Hebrews 9.22b, without the shedding of blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. 
And I could go on and on this morning. These are great gospel verses. Verses that I've hidden in my heart. And that God brings to memory. And he does that with other verses as I meet with people, depending on what they're going through and what they're struggling with. He brings back to mind those verses that I've memorized. So, my question to you this morning is, what phrases or jingles do you remember? They're probably already going through your head because of the ones I already shared, right? You're already thinking about those ones that you grew up <clears throat> with. But I also want to encourage you, what Bible verses do you remember? What Bible verses do you have hidden in your heart that God has used in your life in incredible ways? Those are important things. We have to remember. And so Moses shared with the Israelites what the Lord had shared with him. He told them about commemorating the day the Lord set them free from slavery in Egypt and about consecrating their firstborn male sons and animals they would need to share with the next generation how God had saved them and why they sacrificed for him so that they would never forget. Both commemorating and consecrating would require sacrificing on their part. And what we can learn from this passage of Scripture today is our big idea, and you'll see it on the screen, sacrificing for the Lord honors him. We're going to see that through this passage and how it applies to us as well. But before we do that, would you just bow your heads with me? as we commit it to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you today. We thank you that, um, that we can uh, consecrate things to you, Lord God, that we can commemorate things that have happened in our lives because of a relationship with you. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would just come by your Holy Spirit and fill each heart and mind. I pray that each person would just be uh, encouraged and strengthened or convicted, whatever you need to do in their hearts and minds today. Lord, I pray that they would open themselves up to you that you would work in, in a powerful way. And so, Lord, I pray that they would hear your voice and not my voice today. Lord, we want to hear from you. We want to become more like your son, Jesus. We want to be transformed by your word. And so we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have two points today. The first one is consecrate. And the second one is commemorate. And consecrate really comes in verses 1 and 2, and then down in verses 11 to 16. So we're going to look at, it's kind of sandwiched, uh, uh, the other information sandwiched between these. But <clears throat> let me read those verses for you. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to follow along. Exodus 13, verses 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Consecrate to me every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belongs to me, whether man or animal. Now drop down uh, to verse 11, and let's start there. After the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives you and gives it to you as he promised on oath to you and your forefathers, you are to give it over to the Lord, the first offspring of every womb. All the firstborn males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem with the lamb every firstborn donkey, but if you do not redeem it, break its neck. Redeem every firstborn among your sons. In days uh, to come, when your sons ask you, what does this mean? Say to them, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought us out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed every firstborn in Egypt, both man and animal. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn sons. And it will be like a sign on your hand and a symbol on your forehead that the Lord brought us out of Egypt with his mighty hand. <clears throat> So as we look at this, what we see in verses 1 and 2 is that the Lord was speaking to Moses. So again, God is still giving Moses instructions here that he wants him to share with the Israelites. The Lord spoke to Moses and told him to consecrate to him every firstborn male. The first offspring of every womb among the Israelites belonged to the Lord. It was his right. It did not matter if it was a human or an animal. It belonged to the Lord. Now, Moses obviously shortened the command from the Lord at the beginning of this section, verses 1 and 2, because he elaborates in more detail what that command entailed in verses 11 to 16, uh, as he shared it then with the Israelites. So that's what we see in verses 11 to 16. Moses finally shares it with the Israelites, this command from the Lord. And the command to consecrate the firstborn human and animal was reserved for the future. Do you see it here? He says they would need to observe this command when the Lord brought them into the land of the Canaanites. That's the promised land. It's been taking a long time for them to get there, but the Lord had promised this land to them uh, and their forefathers on oath. 
So we have to go back hundreds of years into Genesis chapter 17, verse 8, and we see these words. <clears throat> and this is God speaking to Abraham. The whole land of Canaan, where you are now an alien, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. And so I want you to think about our first principle today as I blow my nose. God keeps his promise. All right, there we go. Now we can keep going. So God keeps his promises, right? We see that here. This message from the Lord about their future would have encouraged or should have encouraged the Israelites because what do we see here? It's not if the Lord would bring them into the promised land, but then they would have to observe this command, but after the Lord brought them into the promised land. Wow, that should give them incredible confidence. Like, it's not an if. Like, it's going to happen. God had promised this. It's going to take place. Now, it's been 400 years in Egypt, right? And I don't know how many under 100 years that uh, God spoke to Abraham. Here, so it's been hundreds upon hundreds of years waiting for this promise to be fulfilled. But God didn't forget, and he wasn't slow. This was according to his timing and his purpose. So we can trust the Lord to keep his promises about our future, too. The Lord has promised to never leave us or forsake us. We see that in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8. And then the writer of Hebrews quotes the same passage out of Deuteronomy 31, 8, that he'll never leave us or forsake us. Then the writer of Hebrews go, goes on and says, so we can say with confidence, the Lord is our helper. Isn't that a great promise? Yeah. He's never going to leave us or forsake us. Now, we turn our back on him, don't we? You can nod your head up and down like that, yeah. That happens. The Lord has promised to send Jesus a second time to take us home to be with him. How many of you are ready for that? Woo, I am. He, he could crack the sky wide open today. I'd be okay with that. We would all move to heaven together. How about that? Instead of us to Virginia, right? Let me read this for you. I love this promise. This is out of Revelation chapter 21, <clears throat> verses 1 to 8. Listen to this promise. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice uh, from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with, is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself uh, will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. Can't wait for that. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters, and all liars, their place will be in the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. So we see two promises here, don't we? That if you're a part of God's family, if you have given your life over to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have this new heaven and this new earth that you're going to experience together with God. He's going to be our God. He's going to dwell with us once again like he did when Jesus was here. And there's not going to be any mourning. There's not going to be any sorrow. There's not going to be sadness or sickness. Uh, none of that stuff. It's all going to be wiped away, right? Those are, wow. But boy, if you are like any of these other things that are mentioned here at the end of, of uh, Revelation 21, you know, you're, the promise for your future is the lake of burning fire. It's hell to be separated from God for all of eternity. So we see those two promises here, but I want to kind of focus on the encourage one, encouraging one today. We should be encouraged with God's future promises for us. He's never going to leave us. He's going to send Jesus again. We can spend eternity with him in a new heaven and a new earth. And so what we see next is the details of the command about consecrating the firstborn. What was required? He said, give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. So this was firstborn males of livestock. They were to be sacrificed as holy to the Lord. The livestock included sheep, goats, and oxen or cattle. They were considered clean animals that the Israelites were allowed to eat. 
And they were to be offered as a sacrifice to the Lord. We saw this in, in Numbers chapter 18, verse 17. It says this. I'll read it for you again. But you must not redeem the firstborn of an ox, a sheep, or a goat. They are holy. Sprinkle their blood on the altar and burn their fat as an offering made by fire, an aroma pleasing to the Lord. So our second principle today that I don't want us to miss is this. God has the right of ownership to our first and best. That's what he was saying to the Israelites. He's saying it to us again today. Just as the Israelites had to offer the first and best of their livestock, we need to offer the first and best of our lives and work. We need to be willing to offer the best of our time, our income, our resources to the Lord. So I have a couple of questions for you today. How are you doing with offering the best of your time to the Lord? Are you spending time in fellowship with him on a daily basis and with his people on a weekly basis? How are you doing with offering the best of your income to the Lord? Are you giving consistently to him? How are you doing with offering the best of your resources to the Lord and your gifts and abilities? Are you sharing those gifts and abilities that the Lord has given you with others and with the church? And then this question, all of us probably need to answer, is there room for improvement? Certainly. I say yes to that. There's room for improvement in all those in my life, my time, my income, my resources. And so maybe you're ready to take this first next step today on the back of your communication card, and it says this, to recognize God's ownership of my first and best by offering the best of my time, income, and resources to him. And guess what? For most of us, that may take some sacrifice on our part. We're going to have to sacrifice things that we spend our time on so that we can spend time with God. We might have to sacrifice buying something so that we can give consistently to the Lord. We might have to sacrifice other things so that we can use our resources, our, our gifts and abilities for the Lord. And that takes us back to our big idea today that sacrificing for the Lord honors him. How many of you want to honor the Lord today? I do. I want to honor him. And so the firstborn, then, we see of unclean animals were to be redeemed. In this text, donkeys were the, um, are the token animal mentioned to represent all unclean animals that were used for work. So if you, if you were listening to Numbers chapter 18, verse 15 says this, The first offspring of every womb, both man and animal, that is offered to the Lord is yours, but you must redeem every firstborn son and every firstborn male of unclean animals. So see, in that, and no... And numbers, we see that it's more than just donkeys. It's all unclean animals. That firstborn is still has to be redeemed. Stewart, in his commentary, says this. In the case of a donkey, a non-firstborn lamb was an appropriate substitute, since all firstborn lambs must be given to God and none held back to serve as redemption substitutes. Does that make sense today? So it's like he says, you can have a lamb. It's not going to be the firstborn one. He's already been sacrificed. But you can use that to redeem an animal that you can use for work. If the owner of the donkey was not prepared to redeem it by sacrificing a lamb, then he had to break its neck. It was holy. The firstborn was God's holy possession. It belonged to him. The holy was not to be used for the ordinary unless it was redeemed. So again, we see sacrifice here. Sacrificing for the Lord honors him. So redemption of the firstborn males was not limited to just unclean animals, but also to human sons. We see that here. And this is just some scripture back, uh, background to help us with that. We've got to go back to Numbers chapter 18 again. Verse 16 says this, When they are a month old, you must redeem them at the re redemption price set at five shekels of silver, according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 geras. Then if we go into Leviticus chapter 12, verses 6 to 8, we see these words. When the days of her purification for a son or daughter are over, she is to bring to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting a year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a dove for a sin offering. He shall offer them before the Lord to make atonement for her, and then she will be ceremonially clean from her flow of blood. These are the regulations for the, women, uh, for the woman who gives birth to a boy or a girl. If she cannot afford a lamb, she is to bring two doves or two young pigeons one for a burnt offering and the other for a sin offering. In this way, the priest will make atonement for her and she will be clean. So let's look down into Luke in the New Testament, chapter 2, verses 21 to 24. This is Jesus and Mary and Joseph. Listen to these words. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise him, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he had been conceived. 
when the time of their purification according to the law of Moses had been completed, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. So they couldn't afford the lamb. <clears throat> they had to do the two doves or two pigeons. So Jesus, the Redeemer, was redeemed, even though he didn't need to be. Isn't that crazy? His parents were obedient to the command to consecrate the first male that opened the womb. And that was Jesus for Mary. The command was to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. But why was this required? It was a way to remember <clears throat> how the Lord rescued the Israelites from slavery. For the Israelites, God used his mighty hand to bring them out of Egypt. When Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let them go, the Lord killed every firstborn male and animal in Egypt. Remember? Since the Lord passed over the firstborn sons and animals of the Israelites, they remembered um, his mercy and protection by sacrificing the first male offspring of every womb and redeeming each of their firstborn sons. They had to be redeemed. It would be like a sign on their hand and a symbol on their foreheads. Kyle and Dillich explain it this way. The line of thought referred to merely expresses the idea that the Israelites were not only to retain the commands of God in their hearts and to confess them with the mouth, but to fulfill them with the hand or in act and deed, and thus to show themselves in their whole bearing as guardians and observers of the law, as the hand is the medium of action and carrying in the hand represents handling, so the space between the eyes or the forehead is the part of the body which is generally visible, and, uh, and what is worn there is worn to be seen. So this is a, a symbol. He's saying it should be like this, uh, that you won't forget, that you will remember. Remembering was important so it could be passed down to future generations. So just keep this in mind. The Israelites, they don't know it yet, but they're going to be wandering in the wilderness for 40 years. So they're going to need to pass this down for 40 years before they even make it to the promised land to be able to fulfill this consecration that God said would take place when they got to Canaan, to the promised land. So our third principle today is this. God is pleased when we, when we remember how he saved us. Just like the Israelites, it's important for us to remember how the Lord saved us. For some of us, it was dramatic and supernatural, right? He saved us from a life of destruction and rebellion against him. For others, it was perhaps a recognition of God's hand at work through our entire lives. You know, that was, that was me, right? Four years old at the parsonage in Greencastle, Pennsylvania. I prayed to receive Christ. And I didn't understand it all of it at that point. But as I grew and developed, God continued to protect me. And, and it, mine's just been a... a a recognition of God's hand at work in my life for all of these years. And some of you have that same kind of testimony. However the Lord saved us or saved you, it's worth remembering. And so I want to encourage you with the second next step today, and that's to take time this week to remember how Jesus saved me and then thank him. But we also see the importance of sharing. If this command was going to make it until the Israelites entered the promised land, it would need to be shared from generation to generation. And so we see what uh, the command is here as Moses is giving it to the Israelites. When a son would ask his father about the meaning of sacrificing the firstborn animal and redeeming the firstborn son, he would share with him what it meant. And this was a foreshadowing of Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. Some of the Israelites in the first century would recognize the significance of Jesus' sacrifice. Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 tells us this. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Here's the substitute. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19b and 20 say this. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. We were redeemed. Therefore, honor God with your body. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19 tell us this. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Jesus, a lamb without blemish or defect. Isn't that wonderful? Jesus was our lamb substitute to take our sin. 
Principle number four is this. God is glorified when we share why we sacrifice. When our children ask us why we sacrifice our time, income, and resources for the Lord, then we have an incredible opportunity to share what it means for us. We can share that we sacrifice our time, income, and resources to serve the Lord at church or with another ministry organization because it's a, <coughs> it's a way of glorifying God and honoring God for saving us. We model for them that we are grateful to the Lord for rescuing us from sin and death. Merida says this in their commentary. When they ask uh, you about the Lord's Supper or other questions regarding salvation, are you ready to answer? This is a great time to share the gospel with your own child. We were slaves, but God rescued us. We deserved the death angel, but God passed over us. Then tell them of the marriage supper in the future in Revelation 19. One day we will sit down at a banquet table with our king. Tell them it is by the strong hand of God that the captives are set free. As parents, we have a holy responsibility of catechizing our kids, pointing them to Jesus. That's a great responsibility. I've enjoyed being able to do that with my kids and now with my grandkids. But we don't have to just do it with our children. We can share the same things with others. And so maybe you're ready to take this third next step today. And that's to glorify God by sharing with, and you get to fill that blank in. What person or group do you want to share with about Jesus and how, why I sacrifice if it's time, income, or resources? Maybe it's all three. We have a great opportunity just to share with people, like, this is why I sacrifice these things, because of what God has done for me. I want to glorify him. So the question for you today is, who will you share with even today? Moses not only spoke to the Israelites about consecrating the firstborn sons and animals, but he also spoke to them about commemorating the day they were rescued from slavery. That's our second point today. And look at verses 3 to 10. This is what God's word says. Then Moses said to the people, commemorate this day, the day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery, because the Lord brought you out of it with a mighty hand. Eat nothing containing yeast. Today in the month of Aviv, you are leaving. When the Lord uh, brings you into the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, uh, Hivites, and Jebusites, the land he swore to your forefathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, you are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days, <clears throat> eat bread made without yeast, and on the seventh day, hold a festival to the Lord. Eat unleavened bread during those seven days. Nothing with yeast in it is to be seen among you, nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. On that day, tell your son, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time, year after year. <clears throat> so the Lord had already given Moses and Aaron these instructions, but Moses had, to, had not yet communicated them to the Israelites. In chapter 12 is the instructions from the Lord to Moses and Aaron. And now, down in chapter 13, verses 3 to 10, Moses is finally giving the instructions to the Israelites. How were they to commemorate the day that God brought them out of the land of slavery? <coughs> Excuse me. He said, do not eat anything with yeast in it. When the Israelites left Egypt, it was in such a hurry that they did not have time to add yeast to their bread. In order to commemorate this part of the Exodus, the Israelites were to sacrifice yeast or leaven every year for seven days. And so that takes us back to our big idea today, that sacrificing for the Lord honors him. They were to sacrifice yeast for the seven days of the festival of unleavened bread. All yeast was to be removed from their dwellings so that the bread would not accidentally be leavened. And as we learned in chapter 12, and again in verse 10 here, this was to be a continual, ongoing, annual ceremony for the Israelites. They were supposed to share with their children why they were sacrificing yeast in their bread. They were to share that they were uh, doing this because of what the Lord did for them when they came out of Egypt. That takes us back to our fourth principle that we already talked about, that God is glorified when we share why we sacrifice. We see again the use of the idea that they, they were to retain the commands of God in their hearts, confess them with their mouths, and fulfill them with their hands. 
That's verse 9. It says this, like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord is to be on your lips, for the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. So that takes us back to our third principle, that God is pleased when we remember how he saved us. So we're going to commemorate our Savior's perfect sacrifice on the cross this morning following the message with Holy Communion. We saw today that the firstborn sons had to be redeemed. We also saw that the firstborn male animals that were unclean or used for work could, could be redeemed with a substitute lamb or goat. You and I have the opportunity to be redeemed because of Jesus' substitutionary sacrifice for us. Aren't you grateful for that today? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says this, But God made him, that's Jesus, who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We have no righteousness in our own selves. It only comes from being in a relationship with Jesus. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 says this, He who did not spare his own son, that's God, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Again, God didn't spare his own son. He sacrificed him. And we need a substitute because we have all sinned. I shared these verses with you at the beginning, ones that I've memorized. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We don't reach the perfection of God because of that sin in our lives. <clears throat> and we're born that way. And Romans 6.23 tells us that, you know, for the wages of sin, what we earn or deserve for our sin is death. It's not a physical death because none of us would be here because we are all sinners. But it's a spiritual death. It's a separation from God for all of eternity. But the second half of that verse says, but, you know, he gives us a free gift of eternal life through his son, Jesus. Romans 5, 8 says, but God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we didn't want to be in a relationship with Jesus, while we didn't want God telling us what to do, when we were in a rebellion against him, God says, I love you so much. Even in that rebellion, I sent my son to die on a cross to take your punishment for sin so that one day when you turn to me and repent, it's already taken care of. That's the great love of God. And we're not good people, just so you're aware. Some people think that they're a good pe person. And I, I hate to burst your bubble today, but you're not. And I'll explain why. We might think that we are, but I would venture to say that most of us have lied at one point in our lives. So that makes us a liar. That breaks one of the Ten Commandments. Most of us have probably taken something that didn't belong to us, even if it was small. That makes us a thief. That's one of the other commandments. That's two of ten. Perhaps you've used God's name as a cuss word. That's three of ten. I'm right there with you. Now, these next two, you're probably going to be like, no, nope, didn't do those. I haven't committed adultery or I haven't murdered anybody. But Jesus says in the New Testament, he says, if you look at a woman with lust in your heart or a man with lust in your heart, it's as though you've committed adultery with them. Man, oh, man, it's getting deep in here, isn't it? And he went on and he said, if you just harbor bitterness in your heart and you don't forgive someone else, it's as though you've murdered them. You'll be, you'll be punished in the same way that a murderer will be punished. Whew. That's five of ten. And scripture tells us that if we just fail at one, it's as though we've broken all ten. So do you see we're not good people? But we can be redeemed people, right? <laughs> Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, tell us this. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. God's grace is this. He gives us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve redemption. We don't deserve salvation. We don't deserve eternal life, but he gives that to us. That's how we're saved. And it's by faith. We trust in what Jesus did by faith. We weren't there when he died on the cross, but we trust by faith that that happened. That he took our sin on his body on the cross. And so my question for you today is, are you ready to make that decision 
Are you ready to let the Lord know that you want Jesus to be your sin substitute and you're accepting his gift of salvation through faith? Man, if that's the first time you're making that decision today, take your communication card, flip it over, and mark that. It's under the more information about becoming a follower of Jesus. Make sure your information's on the front side of the card because I want to give you a call. I want to talk to you about that. It's a great decision. And, and because of that decision, Holy Communion takes on a whole new meaning for you. If you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, this doesn't make sense. Because what are we doing here? We're remembering Jesus' broken body for us. And the juice reminds us of his blood that was poured out for us so that we could have life. So if you're not a follower of Christ, this doesn't make sense. You don't even need to do it. But as a follower of Jesus Christ, man, this takes on deep meaning and significance. So as we review before we go to communion, you need to recognize God's ownership of your first and best by offering the best of your time, income, and resources to him. Do you need to take time this week to remember how Jesus saved you and to thank him for saving you? Do you need to glorify God by sharing with an individual or group why you sacrifice your time, income, and resources? And, or do you need to ask Jesus to be your sin substitute by faith? As a body of believers, we need to recognize God's ownership of our first and best here at Idaville Church. We need to take time this week to remember how Jesus saved us as a church and to thank him. We need to glorify God by sharing why we sacrifice our time, income, and resources to the Lord. In his book, The Unnecessary Pastor, Eugene Peterson writes this. My two sons are both rock climbers, and I have listened to them plan their ascents. They spend as much time, much or more time, planning their climbs as in the actual climbing. They meticulously plot their route, and then as they climb, put in what they call protection pitons, hammered into small crevices in the rock face with attached ropes that will arrest a quick descent to death. Rock climbers who fail to put in protection have short climbing careers. Wouldn't you say so? Our pitons or protection come as we remember and hold on to those things when we have experienced uh, God's faithfulness in our lives. Every answered prayer, every victory, every storm that has been calmed by his presence is a piton which keeps us from falling, from losing hope, or worse yet, losing our faith. Every piton in our life is an example of God's faithfulness to us. As we ascend in the kingdom of God, we also realize that each experience, each victory is only a piton, a stepping stone toward our ultimate goal of finishing the race and receiving the crown of glory. Isn't that great? We have to remember those things. We need to commemorate those things, how God has been faithful to us and what he's done. And in those times when we are struggling in our faith and in our walk, we have to remember those things. We have to put a piton in in that place in our life to go, we got to go back to that. I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to fail because I have this protection because of what God's done for me. And so we have a great opportunity this morning to remember and to commemorate what Christ has done for us. And we do it once a quarter, but... We can certainly do it more often than that. We don't have to do it just once a quarter. And it's just to remember what Jesus Christ did for us. And so Roxy's already coming. She's going to play for us. And as the ushers prepare to come and serve the elements today, I just want to give you a couple of instructions. I want to share with you this. You don't have to be a member of Idaville UV Church in order to take communion with us. But you do have to have a personal relationship with Jesus. You had to have taken that step of repentance, crying out to him 